Bull himself. Why is my thing so soft? Oh, sorry everyone. <laughs> I thought I was hearing something that uh, somebody's coming to me. Now we are just out, um, still on the trail looking for some leopards, but we're just stopping for anything else that we can find. We actually saw just now, it's the first time I've seen that in a long time, some red, um, the Natal spurfowl with some of the little chicks but unfortunately they were on the road and they just scuttled off into the long grass so we weren't able to put them on screen for you but they're very cute uh, to see and how they follow up a little bit better than the the, the goslings of the Egyptian geese would um, because they've obviously they've got to move through the bush and the thickets and they've got a little bit more danger I think than the, than the goslings of the geese do um, uh, because they're quite uh, well protected there in the water a little bit less to worry about and those little youngsters of the, the spur fowl they're very adept at following up behind mom and so now I'm just continuing through I'm not sure why I'm not getting great communication but yes that part of the morning it's nice it's warming up quite nicely now and I think we're going to have quite a warm day today. Very often when it is quite cold in the morning, cold start like that, but with a very clear open skies, you can um, very often have a very hot afternoon. Okay, I think um, I did hear that I must uh, go over to Brent. I'm not sure what he's got. Oh, no, I'm not. Okay, sorry, Senzo's helping me out there. I think... My communication there is not the clearest. I can't hear uh, virtually anything, so sorry about that. Yes, uh, I'm going to just continue on through the thickets here and just carry on. Sorry guys, I'm not getting any questions there. It's uh, The communication is something up with my radio, so I'm just going to carry on looking as we go through. Here, I've often found the lions on this particular road here. Okay, I did hear that I'm going to link to Brent. Is that alright, Senzo? Right, everyone, I'm going to send you on over to Brent and I'm going to try and sort out my earpiece. Well, can you believe it? We've come through the open area of Impala Plains. Not even an Impala that the plains are named after. And, uh, we're now on the next little open sea line area, and again, not even an impala. I think they're all on quarantine. So, no sign of Shadulu coming back yet, but we are keeping our eyes very much peeled. Ha! Another track. Look at this one. It's a long track. Let me move the stick. So there we go, it goes like that all the way across the road. The little stones that have fallen in it. Now, hashtag Safari Live, if you know what critter made this track across the road. Very distinct track. We actually see quite a lot of them when we're out on foot. They can confuse people. A lot of new people to the bush think it's a snake. It's not. Ha! Ah, now, a good question, Saskia. Saskia wants to know, are there any animals that bury their food to keep it safe? Uh, well, not in so much as bury, Saskia. Uh, well, actually, I lie. Dung beetles will bury dung, but that's obviously a home for their, 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 their young ones to start feeding on. Uh, squirrels will hide food in holes and crevices uh, to keep it safe. And um, hyenas will hide food in water so the scent doesn't go around so they when they're very full they can come when they've finished digi digesting whatever they've eaten they can come back and uh, have a have a munch again on whatever rotting carcass they've managed to deposit in a pan or water hole so yes yeah, certain animals do hide food not many will dig to hide food such as a dog uh, but yes some animals do hide food to keep it safe leopards put it in a tree 
It sounds like, unfortunately, Tandy did not do that last night. And whatever she caught on Torchwood was, uh, ooh. What have we got here? Oh, this is very cool. It looks like a little meal. What is that? It's, I thought it was a mole cricket for a second. Stop moving. Let's see how many legs you got. Come on. Come on. Come on, you can climb up my hand. Do it. There we go. Oh, it's so fast. I'm just trying to see if it's a, a larval stage. Oh, goodness. It's not a larval stage of something. So it's only got six legs. I'm not sure what that is. Possibly a type of cockroach, just judging by the shape. Now, cockroaches come in many, many shapes and forms. Uh, for a while, I thought it might be quite a, a rare species of millipede, but it's not. Only six legs. So I think it's actually some t form of cockroach. I actually have ne never seen one of those before here. Here he comes. I say you've got lots of different types. Oh, he's doing a wheel spin there. He's trying to get through the sand. Oh, off he goes. Well, that's cool. I'm going to have to go have a look in the insect book. Um, I've never seen one of those here, or anything like that here before. I've seen, I've seen similar things in the, in the rainforest, but never, never out here in the savannah. Okay. Ah, you guys are too clever today. Mrs. Zero, you are spot on. It is indeed ants. Now, it's about the only thing we've seen was that one ant running through that uh, ant trail. And uh, as I say, we haven't even seen an impala. And uh, well done, Mrs. Zero. Now, as I say, normally there's impala out here, often zebra, wildebeest, but I think they must all be on quarantine. Now, one interesting thing after covering the amount of ground we've covered today. I mean, this is the first hyena track we've seen. So, there haven't been many busy hyenas out last night. Very, very interesting. I mean, we've covered, as I say, probably, how, how many k's? Probably three, three, four kilometers so far this morning. And this is uh, along this last section of this road is the only place we've seen hyena tracks. Now, let's see what other wonders are wet. It's, def it's getting hot now. The temperature's definitely up on the rise. The mercury is rising. I guess, well, we started this morning at about 16 degrees Celsius. I guess we're probably pushing 26, maybe even 27 at the moment. But that is the nice thing about this part of the world, is that even though it is cold some of the nights and chilly in the morning, the days are just glorious. Well, it seems like Ralph has fixed his, his comms issue. So let's see what his plans are for the last little bit of this morning's safari. Yes, thank you everybody. And I have now fixed my communication. It's, uh, it's always a bit of a worry when you can't hear what's going on. But um, look at these male impala here. They were, they were all having a go at each other. And they were disturbing all the little lapwings as well. But uh, as it starts to heat up, they'll probably also be going off and looking for some shade. This is now in quarantine. And I just wanted to loop around and see if there were any leopard um, marks or anything around Galago and this side of things. Because I also know... I think Brent went onto Zoe's and that side, but I want to check the other side just to see if there's been any activity there. But uh, these males are hard at work establishing their dominance. And you can see this time of year as well, their necks start to, to thicken up. And that's from fighting with each other, but also from um, taking out their frustrations on any bush that will uh, be near to them. You can see the heat haze starting to come up.
Okay, so from these beautiful Impala, let's head on over to Taylor, who says she has something that's not as beautiful as them. It was once beautiful, but sadly it is no longer living. What we have here is a young Dacre, very, very young in fact, that has been killed, obviously. And what's interesting is that it's the baboons. A big troop of baboons have come through here and actually killed this Dacre. It's fairly fresh. I just can't believe that we didn't, I was on Chitwa, we didn't hear the screams that would have been coming. Um... As a shame, it's not a very pleasant death for this young little Dacre. Uh, you can see, look how they've eaten it, eaten most of the flesh. Now, baboons have a seriously varied diet. They uh, will eat anything from flowers to new leaves, grass, beetles, grubs, any insects. And then, of course, they're known to take things like this, like Dacre. And um, we've seen it a few times where they've been feeding on them. It's, it's quite grim. And I reckon that this poor little Dacre was just sitting in the grass, tr minding its own business, trying to stay hidden. And unfortunately, a baboon found it and got it. Probably a big male, but they definitely were walking here. You can see some baboon tracks here. You can't see those ones. Uh, if you look very carefully, you can see all around here. The ground has been moved about quite a bit. They're all baboon tracks. There's no real clear ones you can see right now. So the car's just too close. So cr quite crazy, hey? Now they've twisted its neck. I don't know what they would have done if they... There's a couple of bite marks here. If it, normally the baboons will hold the, the dacre, if what I've seen, and then they end up biting on its back. It's terrible. It really, really is very, very sad. But it is just one of those things, I'm afraid. Nothing has got to it yet. That's how fresh it is. Like I said, it's all very pliable. The rigor mortis hasn't even set in. Um, but this meal will not go wasted. Somebody else will come through here, whether a, a raptor might scavenge off it, a jackal, a young leopard looking for a meal, a hyena would very, very easily eat this. The flies will be on it soon. Uh, I'm sure little beetles and things will come to it as well. So we'll just leave it there. Very interesting to see, though. Not necessarily the nicest. And it's why you don't mess with baboons. You don't tease them. You don't do anything like that because you will end up being, uh, will end up second best. And we can do that to an antelope. They'll catch fully grown dacre as well and quite easily tear them apart. Sure. Quite hectic. Very interesting. I don't know where the troop of baboons have gone now. I think they may have walked up Philemon's cut line. Maybe we can see them. Cool. Right, off we go. Let's carry on. Let's see what else we can find. Maybe we're going to bump into the troop and find the culprit as to who killed that young Dacre. Uh, what else are we going to see today? That was interesting. We've been seeing lots of little things, eh? haven't we? Yeah, they all walking out. Just see this whole road is littered with but there they are. They are the baboons. Let's go see. They're gonna be quite nervous of us. They typically are. Unfortunately, humans and baboons don't really have the greatest relationship. I'm gonna just stop here because they're gonna run. They've already started running off. But there they are. Little one riding on mom's back. You're getting a bit old for that. The vervet monkeys typically attaching themselves to the underside, so do the baboons. Once they get a bit older, they prefer to ride on their mother's backs. Very nice to see. No one's now holding on, hoping to have a little bit of a sleep. Again, I think it was going to be one of the big male baboons that would have done that. So that little take her. There we go. Very cool. Now, we're quite a distance away. We must be about a hundred meters or so away from them. So they seem to be fairly, fairly relaxed with our presence at the moment. But if I were to go any closer, I would imagine they would not be so happy and they'd probably end up running away from us. Feeding in the guari trees now. A large bulk of their diet is, uh, is fruit, in fact, and plant matter. But they do substitute it. And, and then feed on meat and things when they can, when it's available. But very happy to be in that tree. 
A lot of the flowers are obviously disappearing, but at least the guari trees have got their fruit. The jackalberries have also started to develop, not quite ripening just yet. They've been lucky. They've had lots of fruit all, all year round. And there was a bit of a gap, then the fruit from the uh, brown ivory trees were dropping too, which is delicious. There you go, you can just see them munching on the quarries. Now they'll be going for the ripe ones, but I'm sure they eat the odd one that's not so ripe every now and then. Now the one joining in. Very flimsy tree. Oh, wow, Ruby, this is your first baboon sighting. That's fantastic. We've been lucky. Brent had an amazing vervet monkey sighting a few afternoons ago. I had a great one yesterday morning of uh, vervet monkeys up in the tree. And I think this is possibly my first baboon sighting since being back in the Sabi sand. Obviously, they come and terrorize us around camp. That's uh, not an uncommon thing. There must be a vehicle coming that they're running like that. I can hear a few cars moving around. And uh, oh, now there's a dispute. I can hear baboons screaming and running. We're very lucky to see this. We don't often get to spend time. We spent a lot of time with them in the Maro. I most certainly did. Let's go around the corner, let's see, because it does open our, up a fair amount. So perhaps they'll be relaxed. These ones are probably going to run. But if I just sneak around here, it might be quite nice. Maybe they're climbing up and down that brown ivory. Definitely some shouting going on here, and I heard a big male sort of announcing himself. Oh, they are in the brown ivory too. Watch them. They're all going to come down now. Here they are. One on the ground. The others are going to probably follow. There's a few in there. There's one. Where have you gone? Went back in again. You can just see the tree sort of shaking and as it's shaking some leaves and maybe there is still fruit up in that tree falling down to the ground. But you wouldn't know it, hey, you could drive straight past that tree and if it weren't for the baboons down on the ground you probably wouldn't know that there's anything in there. Look at that. And there's no wind. There's not a breath of wind out today. I'm still looking for some of the big males. I haven't seen any yet. Perhaps this is a very large troop and they're all spread out. Or maybe they're the ones that are up. There's one up in, I think that might be a big male, top left on that tree. Can you see? Uh, yes. There's a big male, it looks like it. Uh, Ross, oh, the most unusual carcass that I've come across. Oh, that doesn't even look like a massive male. It looks like a young, youngish one. Um, I'm trying to think now. Uh, the most unusual carcass. Oh, uh, I don't know. Dakers are pretty cool like that. I mean, that's unusual when you see it, leftovers from a baboon. That's something you don't get to see all the time. I could probably count on one hand the times that I've seen that. Uh, I suppose seeing a bird carcass is not too unusual. I've seen lots of owl carcasses, sadly, on the roads. That's no good, obviously, being hit by cars. I can't. I didn't see that. Sebastian's saying the diker that's got struck by lightning, but I actually didn't see that. I have seen a giraffe that's been sh uh, struck by lightning, though. Down in the Eastern Cape, I've seen that type of a carcass. I'm just trying to think. Maybe like a... I've seen a white-tailed mongoose carcass, and it took me ages to figure out what it was. It was so sort of mauled. I don't know what had got to it. I couldn't work it out. I couldn't see the tracks. It was in the grass. Anyway, whatever it was, it had destroyed it, and it looked quite weird. And also something had eaten half of its face, and so there wasn't much flesh around its face. It, it made it look very scary. I thought I discovered, like, la chupacabra or something like that. That's what uh, it kind of resembled. And it was a strange looking. So I think I'm going to say that. The one, the one time I found it, white-tailed mongoose carcass. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't here. This was back in, a few years ago, maybe in about 2015 or so. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Maybe we'll have to ask Ralph and Brent too. Off we go, run your way, baboon. 
You know, something that I haven't really seen um, the baboon, baboons doing is scent marking, um, Eddie. What they will do is they defecate on high points. That's like a favorite thing for a baboon to do. So uh, I'm pretty sure that's a way that would ward off other baboons in the area. Otherwise, they're very vocal. They use their voices a lot to sort of announce to everybody that they're in this area. And if they do see another troop, remember baboons have got exceptionally good eyesight. They will start shouting at one another right off of the bat. And then that normally will not end up in a fight. Sometimes it does, though. If the other troop gets a bit too cheeky, they might race on and try and chase one another out. But um, scent marking, like how a lion and a leopard would, no, they don't typically do things like that. Very nice, though. Really exciting to see these baboons. But I'm, I'm so sorry we have to watch from such a distance, but otherwise they're not going to be too relaxed. Now, there's going to be quite a few big males in here. Uh, I mean, there was one that we saw in the tree. He looks big, but I've seen much bigger baboons before. Much, much, much bigger. And um, they are so, so, so powerful. Watching them pick up rocks like they weigh absolutely nothing. Throwing them around, turning over fallen tree or bits of log. Crazy. Just nibbling around, watching us, keeping an eye out. Just keeping an eye out on us. Awesome. Right, well, we'll see what else we can find. Very really nice sighting of the baboons. Thank you guys for, for joining us this morning. And uh, off you go to Ralph, and let's ask him. Let's find out what is the strangest carcass he's ever found. The strangest carcass I've ever found. Um, sure, I've found quite a few weird ones. I think one of the strangest was um, uh, when I had some lions, they were feeding on an aardvark. But uh, it was quite strange because I've never seen animals feeding on an aardvark. I've never seen an aardvark carcass up until that point. Um, but it was also strange because as they were feeding on it, it was making them sick. So they were vomiting and I don't know if it was because the... And it was a fresh kill. I don't know if, if it was that the, the art fork was sick or if it had some kind of parasites or what, but um, they would eat and then basically five minutes later vomit out what they had eaten and then, and then eat more. So that, it wasn't just the strangest carcass, it was the strangeness around the whole carcass itself as well. So that was one of the strange things that I've encountered. Um, and it was quite unusual because we saw this art fork, it was down in the Eastern Cape, and we saw this art fork out in the middle of the day, and he wasn't very scared of the vehicles either. So I'm not sure what kind of sicknesses that art fork get, but uh, I'm pretty sure that there, he, there was something not right with him because he was really just walking around, and I haven't seen that very regularly. You do sometimes get art fork walking around during the day, but it's generally when it's quite cool and quite foggy or misty or overcast weather, and then you'll get them walking around a little bit during the day. But this guy was out in the heat of the day and then got hit by the lions, who then, um, yeah, were sick themselves. So that was quite unusual and quite strange. I still don't really know why. But, um, I hope that we find some carcasses today. It's maybe those lions get to do a bit of hunting, maybe the leopards as well. Shame for the animal that gets eaten, but, um, well, wonderful for the predators. That's why they are predators, and, uh, and that's why we are in this portion of the Greater Kruger National Park, because of the great concentration of these leopards. Where else in the world would you be able to see such wonderful leopards like we see here on Juma? And uh, we also get to see a lot of hyenas. Now I'm just going to pop in here at the old hyena den, just to see if there's any activity here. I'm still on the hunt for that hyena den, but um, every chance I get, I just pull in and see if there's any activity at any of the, the old sites. I haven't had any luck as yet. Carol, to answer your question, and thanks for asking, yes, hyenas do have territories, and they're normally pretty big. Um, and it's quite difficult to distinguish exactly where their territories are. Um, and generally, they make their den site in quite a central area. And how they mark their territories is uh, through uh, mostly 
anal pastings. So they'll sort of straddle like this grass that's here just in front of us in the middle of the road. They'll straddle that and then um, it's actually quite interesting to see. We saw it um, up and uh, close and personal with the with the little cubs uh, in uh, the Masai Mara next to their den site of the northern clan. Um, even from a tiny age they also exhibit that um, marking with the anal pasting but uh, it, it's um, yeah, it's, it's obviously, I mean, we're looking very closely at the, at the anus of an animal, um, and, uh, but it, it, it almost inverts itself as it sort of uh, utilizes the gland, which is just on the inside of its, of, of its um, anus, and, uh, and then obviously this little uh, dollop of liquid comes out. But there's, there's a couple of different liquids that they actually put out. One is a very dark color and another one is is quite light in color and um, the one carries on uh, the, the scent stays for a very long period of time and the other one the the lighter one um, uh, doesn't but it, uh, it does indicate a little bit different in terms of what it is doing now I just wanted to stop here because there's something actually very interesting I'm just going to jump off just quickly I want to show you this wonderful plant there that since I can show you this over here, you see them here, they're actually sticking out. These are called black stick lilies or baboon's tail. And they, they're actually starting to get leaves now. Um, and they, I think they do get a, it's a white flower on them. Black, stilly, black stick lily or baboon's tail. And um, quite useful in that the old travelers that used to walk... Uh, move through here the transport riders and so on you can break it off and use it as a very good pot scourer um, because it's it's like almost like that uh, goldilocks um, uh, brush type uh, very good to clean pots and and uh, cutlery and utensils etc but the bushmen also used to um, use that as um, they used to soak it in things like the balanites, um, uh, the, the torchwood, they used to make oil from that torchwood, uh, the seeds, they crush that and make an oil, and they soak this in there, and then um, that's when uh, they can light that, and they can use it as a fantastic torch, or to move their fire. If they had to move from one place to another, instead of starting a whole new fire, which can be quite um, uh, an exertion, they would just literally take one of these, light it on their fire, and they would be able to move um, to uh, another place using this, um, either as their torch, or as their, uh, well, it, it serves a double purpose. They can use it as a torch, and they can then move to another place and light their fire, where they may be potentially have a new camp. So very interesting black stick lily or the baboon's tail. Okay and we're just in here behind where that uh, hyena den was and there's another little site uh, termite mound that I just wanted to have a look at and see if there's any activity there because that that one where the little baby was when I was first here at Juma has gone a little bit quiet. Doesn't seem like there's any activity there at all. Let's have a look around here. Uh, Saskia, my interest around hyenas has come from a very young age when um, <laughs> we actually had uh, hyenas raid our camp and, and, and run off with our entire fridge down the road uh, in the middle of the night, um, bite through the top of the fridge which was locked closed, they bit Right, they, they ripped this freezer to pieces. I, it was totally incredible. I, I just, from that young age, I was about eight years old when that happened, and we were in Mana Pools in Zimbabwe. Um, and uh, I've just been fascinated ever since then. Um, and every night when we used to shine the torch around camp, there was just eyes of hyenas waiting for us to go to sleep so that they could come into camp and sniff around and and they could obviously smell our meat that was in the freezer and they literally pulled it out the back of our van because it was so hot we would leave the the back door open but it's very high uh, out of a vw uh, camper van and um, they, they pulled this freezer out of the back there dragged it down the road two kilometers and uh, and ate all of our meat so from then on we were meatless um, 
and their hyenas had filled their boots. But um, yes, it's just going along the lines of their strength, their, you know, everything else uh, that they that they are totally strange they almost go against the grain they have a matriarch as opposed to you know a male dominated system um and they yeah, it's just the, the the distances that they run um they, uh, for me it's, it's confusing the way that they operate but within that confusion there is still a system it's 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 fascinating so that's what that's what uh, fascinates me about hyenas, Saskia, is that they almost um, it's just random, but with they, they they have a random system, which if that that doesn't really make sense, but with hyenas it does. It is totally random, but fully in a proper system. Well, it's random for us as humans, isn't it? But for hyenas, it's perfectly normal. And just their survival as well. It's just incredible. I love their call. It's one of the most beautiful um, African calls at night, I think. And when you hear hyena calling, it just really reminds me of, of home and the bush and the wilderness. So lions, etc. There we go. Senzo is giving us his best impression. Go again. There's it. Ooh. Ooh. We can't find them. Maybe we can call them out, Senzo. So, everyone, while I continue on my search for this hyena den, I'm not going to stop until I find it. Um, but for this morning, I think we're just about at the end of the show. Um, but uh, I'll say goodbye. But uh, let's head you on over to Brent. And I think he also wants to do the same. Hello, hello. Now, Ralph was just chatting about uh, the most interesting skeleton, I think it was. He said aardvark. Now, the most interesting f fossilized skeleton I've ever seen is an aardvark. So, there's a place in western Botswana uh, where there's a bunch of rock hills that come out of the Kalahari sand. And then there's long pipes. And this aardvark is in the process of being fossilized. It fell down one of the old volcanic pipes. And... Uh, it's right down to the bottom and the, it is a perfectly preserved skeleton right down at the bottom about 90 90 meters under the ground and the stalactites yes from the top stalagmites from the bottom stalagmites from the top stalactites from the bottom have started dripping and calcifying this whole artifact skeleton so that's probably the most interesting skeleton i've ever seen in the process of being fossilized but thank you very much for joining us nice to have the uncomers back on the property and hopefully they'll still be this afternoon and maybe a spotted cat or two will make an appearance so from all of us here at safari live it's been great it's been grand it's been absolutely wonderful so we will see you in a few short hours for the sunset safari